Hello and welcome to this episode of Wagon Wheel. Uh, it's a little bit different um, for many, many different, uh, well, actually just for one solid reason uh, we'll get to in a moment. Generally, when I record the Spotify Green Room, because we're recording on Spotify Green Room, and it's also going out on my podcast and it's also going out on YouTube, I have to do a clap at the start. Um, I cannot clap at the moment. I uh, do not have the uh, physical capabilities uh, to clap. Um and uh, the reason I can't clap is because I broke my arm in somewhere between four and six places. Um, I dislocated my wrist. I dislocated my elbow. Uh, it was quite, quite the, uh, the, the fun uh, little moment. Um, I mean, it wasn't fun at all. Um, I just realized I've got my old camera up as well. So my producer is going to be angry um, when, when they realize I don't have my good camera here. But um, my old camera is probably still in my bag, jammed in. Um, but... Let me just explain uh, what is what ha went on. So I was doing some stuff at the Oval and on non-match days at the Oval, uh, doing some work there. And it was quite late. I was getting there quite early in the day, finishing quite late in the day, doing a lot of work um, uh, for various organizations. And then the easiest thing for me to do uh, was to walk home, but it's quite a long trip. Um, and I thought, do you know what? I'll just use my skateboard. That's why... I learned, you know, as much as anything, I learned to skate to teach my boys how to skate, but then also to cut down on long trips. I just haven't really had a chance. Since I got good at skateboarding, we've had the whole COVID thing. Um, and so um, I haven't spent as much time on my skateboard. In fact, come to think of it, I probably haven't had a proper skate um, since before COVID started, uh, which was about the point that I got very good at skating in the first place. So I uh, um, was skating. It was great coming, skating in the oval at night. I can't remember. It must have been about 9, 9.30. And I'm skating through the oval. And I'm just like, this is one of those things that is just absolutely perfect and so much fun. Um, I can't wait to tell my friends I've skated through the oval. Skated out of the oval, up, up through Brixton, uh, got myself on a train. And then all I had to do was uh, skate home. Uh, I live about, I don't know, about a 10-minute walk, 8-minute walk from the train station. So it's only a couple of minutes downhill on the skateboard. Um, and, uh, I was skating and then it, I think at one stage I did realize that A, I was going too fast. B, it was very, very, uh, late at night and I wasn't really focusing and I'd been tired. Um, and then I thought to myself, I should really slow down here. And I happen to be, this, this is my favorite fun bit of this story. <laughs> I happen to be skating down the hill where I taught my boy, boys how to skate. So it's not a particularly dangerous hill. Um, it's um, something that uh, my, my younger son would have been skating on it when he was about five um, and has never fallen down that hill, has never had a problem down that hill. And uh, that was not the case for me, <laughs> obviously. Uh, I came down that hill just a little bit too fast um, and uh, re probably realized that. Uh, I can't remember the exact details of being honest just because uh, a lot went on at that moment and then everything afterwards, but went up. Came down and came down fully on my arm, and yeah, and uh, I still don't know um, how many breaks I actually have on my arm. But there you go. Uh, Podcast-wise, we're gonna. The, part of the reason I'm doing this really is to see if I can. Um, I'm get. I'm still getting very tired. The the uh, operation was a huge success, and I think uh, I'll get my arm back fully, uh, fully operational. At this stage, it is. Uh, it's got more metal in it than the uh, Dennis Lilly cricket bat. Is one for the golden oldies. But, um, uh, yeah, uh, just letting everyone know, that's why there hasn't been as much uh, action around. <laughs> um, I'll try and do this without showing you my nipple. But, yeah, you can see here. It's quite the cast all the way up. Um, so I think the major problem really was around the elbow. Uh, the, there's a break at the elbow. There's a dislocation. Uh, maybe another day I'll take you through everything that went on at the hospital, which is its own uh, dramedy. Uh, but there we go. Uh, I know a lot of people have been asking about the arm and a lot of other people have just probably been thinking, where the hell's Jared? Why is he not doing stuff? So if you've got any specific questions about the arm, <clears throat> I mean, feel free to to ask. As usual, Spotify Green Room, uh, make a request. Uh, you know, uh, Put your hand up if you have a question. I watched yesterday's match, uh, uh, yesterday's test. Sorry, I didn't follow the um, West Indies Pakistan one. I was a bit tired, but I watched the um, England India test. I think I might have had, I've fallen asleep at one stage, which is very unlike me, but I'm still, still recovering from the uh, operation really as much as anything else. 
uh, and I watched a little bit of the 100 game, uh, you know, this is the thing. Uh, I haven't really been able to turn off my brain. So I thought the one thing I could probably do is Spotify Green Rooms, where I don't have to do any writing. I turn up, you guys ask me all the great questions, uh, and then we do it from there. But uh, uh, yeah, I'll just see if anyone is... Taking a while to spool through, but yeah, if anyone does have a question about, um, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, w the timeless ones are the most fun ones I find. So if you if you're about to ask me, uh, you know, what is going to happen next in the test match, I might not be able to help you. But uh, I think we've had our first question come through now, here now. But honestly, just line them up, ask them away. If you're listening to this on uh, on the podcast, or if you're watching this on YouTube, if you want to get involved, download the Spotify Green Room app. Find Jared Kimber on that, uh, and you will get then notifications every time I go live. We generally try and go live on Fridays, um, and if I'm covering a test match, which I kind of am covering this test match, although I've taken the week off, obviously, um, then we we don't do them during live play. Um, but generally, they're around a 1 p.m. Uh, British Standard Time, summertime at the moment, um, uh, because that kind of fits into uh, my schedule quite well at the end of the week. And it's quite a good. I, lo I actually love answering questions. So the more questions, the better. I really do. Um, uh, I, I don't know what it is about my personality or the way my brain works, but they really do help me uh, with my work. So I, I find that this particular Spotify green room is quite handy. And the, the YouTube video version uh, just doesn't work because you can't talk to the people as well. So um, And the, the Twitter spaces doesn't allow you to record. So Spotify green room is perfect for us. But let's answer some questions. My throat feels a bit weird. I think that's, or sounds a bit weird. I think that's just from the, um, the tubing uh, that went down for the general anesthetic. I'm not, I'm not an expert on that, though. All right. Jonathan. Jonathan? Jonathan Ringrose. I think you've got me on mute. Or oh, you've got yourself on mute. Jonathan Ringrose. Hello, Jared. How you doing? How you doing? Good. Good. Awesome. I was What's wondering if you think that T20 cricket, I, I was wondering if you think that T20 cricket could be improved by removing the four over maximum bowler limit per bowler. Like, I think you'd end up seeing more overs bowled by the better quality bowlers. Um, teams would have the option of batting deeper and harder. Um, it could add an extra sort of tactical element to the game and sort of allowing teams, teams to choose how many bowlers they bowl. Um, it seems to be like that, that 10 over maximum was sort of bought into one day cricket to make those middle overs a bit more interesting. But um, like when it was imported into T20, it seems a bit anachronistic now. What do you reckon? Uh, look, I hated it. I hated it in one day cricket. Uh, I hate it in a T20 cricket. If, if you look back at um, one day cricket, I call them the Scott Styrus overs, um, which one day Scott Styrus is going to, you know, abuse me on Twitter for. But it's got, Scott Storis is a kind of bowler that is quite fun to watch in Darren Stevens kind of way when the pitch is nibbling around. Like he was a clever bowler and he had some skills and, you know, he did some things. No one's paying to watch him unless there's a raging green top and he's making really good batters look silly. Most of the time when Scott Cyrus is bowling in a test match, he's, uh, sorry, in a, in a one day game, he's basically just, you know, trying to get through. People are chipping him around. No one's taking it that seriously. I just don't see how that translates directly to T20 cricket. And they did actually, I don't know if you know this, Jonathan, but they did try this in domestic Australian cricket. It's been around 2007, 2008, 2009 uh, for the one-dayers. And you could have, I think your main bowler could bowl a maximum of 13 overs. Um, so you're not, you're not, killing someone by, you know, suddenly making, I mean, the, part of the reason we brought this in is, you know, my dad used to play, um, you know, club one day cricket and he bowled 25 overs from one end and his mate would bowl 25 overs from the other end. We don't want that. I, I, I think that's boring, even if it is, you know, uh, Jimmy Anderson at one end and, you know, Kigisa Rabada at the other end. I, I think that's, that's fundamentally boring. I think we do want, you know, as many different kinds of bowls as possible, but we want that to come from a tactical evolution and from all-rounders. I don't think we want it from this stupid 20% law. So I'm, I'm definitely with you on that. I think you could take what you've said and even take it way, way further. And I know they thought about this for the 100, and I know other competitions have thought about this as well. The only reason no one's done it at the moment, um, and the IPL is a possible one uh, going in the future, is because it costs a little bit of extra money. But if you really wanted to have the most talented players on the field doing their jobs. 
the the way to do that perfectly would be to have 15 players on each team and you know uh, only 11 can bat uh, then we would see all sorts of craziness i think uh, you know you might every team would have a left arm wrist spinner just in case probably uh you do have special you know completely specialist bowlers who don't have to worry about batting at all they spend all their time worrying about bowling uh I think you then would have the best batters going up against the best bowlers. I think it'd be really, really interesting. It'd be completely different from one-day cricket, completely different even from test cricket at a certain point. Uh, ben Lindbergh, who is the uh, the ringer, I think he, he might be freelance, but Ben Lindbergh, who writes for the ringer, who's one of my favourite sports writers, uh, he recently contacted me because he wanted to do a piece about whether pitches were worse when slugging than number 11s were when batting because those are – both of us sort of believe that those are probably the positions at which you are sending someone out to do a job that they are fundamentally uh, not able to do. They don't have the ability uh, to do that. Uh, we know that's not always the case with all number 11s, but certainly the case with a lot. Uh, but uh, what Ben pointed out from his piece is that pitches are even worse than number 11s, which I would have thought that number 11s might, might have had them covered. Um, and in some ways, number 11s have to do the job longer than pitches. At least you can just miss three 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 pitches and get out of there but but yeah i i think i really i like the idea of a strength versus strength t20 format going ahead i think that teams and owners will be upset at that because of the amount of players that you'll need on your squads uh you will need uh i i think that might cause problems with that but i really do like the idea of that so yeah i think um i think jonathan i'm more or less agreeing with you and I also see a way where we don't do it in T20 cricket. And in T20 cricket, we sort of reward the all-round nature a little bit more. But perhaps we do it in one-day cricket. And in one-day cricket, uh, we uh, it's a way of separating one-day cricket from T20 cricket a little bit. Not sure if how, how many bowlers will sign up to bowl 10, 11, 12, 13, you know, it's regularly. Um, well, the 10, I suppose they will, but, you know, adding a little bit of extra time to them. But I could see how that would work in one-day cricket. And you'd make one-day cricket then maybe more an even mix between Red Bull cricket and T20 cricket. But it's a great question, mate. I, I, I do really like that. Um, looks like we've got a few coming through. Are you? Hey, Donald, how are you? Are you feeling I'm better? Gr- I'm much better than I was on Friday night. Oh. Excellent. What's your question, mate? Yeah, so so was that, uh, so what I was asking is, do you remember? I mean, I'm sure you remember, but uh, there were these uh, weird rules that ITC came with about super subs and uh, you know a, a couple of other things. Like that's when uh, a couple of other ODI uh, rules ITC came up with uh, around two two thousand seven. So I wanted to understand why was super sub not that successful. I mean, oh, it's oh, it interesting, and it, it it in today's time it would be. Uh... <laughs> but why actually? No, so the idea of a super sub goes back to what Jonathan just asked, really. it's I don't think there's any problem with having a – so that was – I'll get back to Ben Lindbergh again. So Ben Lindbergh said to me, why has cricket just never had a designated hitter? And he's right. Why do we want a number 11 batting when we could have uh, Ben Dunk? I don't know why Ben Dunk is my designated hitter. He's the best designated hitter of my heart. Um, but, but Ben is right when he, when he asks that question. And that is what the super sub should have been, is you could have uh, your best wrist spinner who you're not necessarily is in your 11, your best fast bowler who's not necessarily in your 11, your best hitter that's not necessarily in your 11, uh, perhaps your backup batter just because you've lost a bunch of wickets. That's what a super sub should have been, right? And then you have a situation where um, once, your, once your bowler has finished his overs, uh, whichever fir- bowler that is, then you he is replaced by an absolutely gun bat, right? So your number 11 now becomes your best player. It's your best bowler mo- more often than not and your best batter combined in one thing. That's a really interesting thing that the super sub could have done. The super sub did not do that. Super sub basically made you pick an, bit, uh, an all-rounder, uh, bits and pieces all-rounder because you were so nervous um, of when, what you were going to need because you could only pick from one player that you had to decide on beforehand. Um, and it meant that – here's a perfect example. Uh, there's a classic game that I wrote about. It's one of my favourite pieces ever if, if you want to go back and read some of my old writing. I wrote a piece about Sean Tate in a domestic final when Sean Tate probably bowled the fastest 
spell that he ever bowled and the craziest spell that he ever bowled. And in that game, the super sub is used. And it must have been, what, 2006? Um, as you said before, 2006, 2007. And Doug Bollinger bowls out. Doug Bollinger was, you know, bowling big hoopy in-swingers back those days before he became quite a good death bowler. So they probably went, look, let's just use him at the top, get him to bowl big hoopy in-swingers with his left arm, and then when he's finished, we'll replace him. But the player they replaced him with was Jason Crazier. Right? Because Jason Crazier was an all-rounder at that point, and uh, he was there so that if they needed a little bit more batting, Jason Crazier would give you more batting than Doug Bollinger. Um, and if you know, if they had a batter that that had gone out early, um, uh, then they could have taken him from the game and replaced him with Jason Crazier. <clears throat> the problem is that Jason Crazier, as a batter, is about as exciting as a wet fart. Right, it's like no one pays money to go and watch Jason Crozier. That's not a designated hitter; it's a designated nudger, uh, and he probably never even really made the most of his batting talent. But he was at best like a, a backup number six. He was really a number seven, and probably better as a number eight who could get you a few runs. Um, but but uh, throughout most of his career, who's paying to watch that? That's not a super sub, right? He he's improved the batting from Bollinger. No doubt about that. He hasn't really changed anything from a spectator point of view. Let's say, I'm trying to think who else they would have had. So 2006, 2007. Um, uh, Suresh Rana was a super sub once. Uh, that I remember in a game for India. Yeah. I, I, and again, you're talking about someone with all-around talent. Now, Suresh Rana is a better player than, than Jason Crozier. Um, but there are, okay, I'm pretty sure this is right. Craig Simmons. Um, who you may remember who, who played a couple of incredible innings for um, in the Big Bash early on. Big, strong hitter. Never quite made it as a one-day player. Him coming in to replace um, uh, Doug, uh, Dougie Bollinger is really interesting. You can use him as a pinch hitter anyway through, anywhere through the order. He could have opened the batting for New South Wales. He could have batted in the middle order. But they couldn't use Craig Simmons because... They didn't know what kind of super sub they needed. So we, we, we basically set up a system where you had to pick a bits and pieces all around them. And that is why the super sub law did not work. If you did it properly and just went, you know, you can, you can pick from two, you can pick from four, or pick from anyone in your squad. We don't care. It's a super sub. You decide on who you want to come in. That, is, that would have, I think, would have stuck around, really. I think it probably would be in T20 cricket now. Um, even the Big Bash didn't quite go back to it. There's nothing wrong with the idea of it. Um, uh, it's just, it just hasn't quite worked the way that it was brought in. Yep. Okay. Uh, thanks, all. No worries. Great question. We're just getting into absolutely nerdy stuff here of, um, of how one day in T20 cricket is run. All right. Who have I got here? Baska. Hey, Jared. Yeah, I hope you're doing well. Yeah, so I remember like uh, I, the Prithi was the super sub in the ICC World 11 in the 2005 Super Series. So it's like the best bits and pieces we get. Uh, no, I should not say to Afridi, but that's how super sub are working. Well, but I mean, if, if you're talking about a World 11, it makes sense, right? Because you can pick, you just pick the best all-rounder who doesn't make the first 11, right? That's a perfect way of having a super sub. The problem is yeah. that if you have a really gun all-rounder in a national team, like Ben, ben Stokes would have been a great super sub. Right, Shakib Al Hassan would have been a great super sub. But how are they not making your first eleven? Right, that's where it didn't make any sense. So you end up with Cameron White as your super sub, or Mark Elam as your super sub. I don't know if Mark Elam ever was a super sub. Mark Elam feels like he should have been a super sub. Uh, what's your question, mate? Yeah, so my question is about like how uh, not regarding a test match, but how KL Rahul has really done well in this series, and now he has jumped the queue. So I wanted to know that yeah I remember that Australia actually followed this uh, uh, policy where the even the when the best player got injured and then even the replacement did very well like Martin Love scoring 100 in the last match or Anthony Stewart taking a hat trick in the last match uh, uh, or even Gillespie scoring 200 in his in his last match they always replaced it by the player who's actually owned the place whereas mm -hmm. now so the uh, some teams actually follow a very different policy, and it may be to do with whether you're a gap player or a generational player, which you have mentioned before. So, uh, what is your take uh, on like uh, who should take precedence when uh, such an injury happens, and then both the players are fit and there's a log jam for pieces? 
Yeah, it, it's a really interesting question. So to go back to why Australia did that, it had never really been done in cricket before. You, some of the old selection stuff, uh, 50s, 60s and 70s, when, when the reporting got to a high level um, and we could follow it properly, it's just like um, it, it's, it doesn't make any sense. It's, it's really quite poor um, the way that the system is – uh, was done and you do have situations where that would happen so think about it this way let's say you are you're the opening bat and you're averaging about 38 to 40 so you're doing a decent job but you you know you're certainly not an automatic player at that point um you, you're probably there and thereabouts being an automatic player and you're hit on the fingers and your fingers are completely mashed up um the best thing you can do for your team and yourself <clears throat> is to have a test or two off, let the fingers recover, maybe change your grip a little bit, do whatever you need to do to come back. What players had started to do through that 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s period was they would just play on, even with mashed up fingers, because uh, if, they, if they went out of the team and an inferior player came in and made 100, that guy would then get five or six tests. So they were losing parts of their career. So what Australia basically did was very, very smart, um, and they said, no, we're going to protect the player who has the position uh, and we're going to say that player gets to come back because otherwise we don't want a bunch of people playing when they shouldn't be playing just so that they can um, go through. And that's where that rule condition kind of thing comes from. The, uh, the problem with the other, this other system of, um, you know, let's have a look at Kyle Rowell. It's, all, it's very possible that KRO will spend a lot of time with the Indian team over the last, what, nine months now? And the Indian team has managed to unlock his red ball batting potential, which we all know has always been there. I mean, he's too good a player. He's played some really good series to not be a consistent red ball player. Certainly, what was his average? 35. He's certainly a better player than that. It's possible that he's unlocked that. It's also possible that as we know with Cal Roll, he hits some incredible form. Um, you know, some players make runs consistently over their whole career and other players go up and down. If you think that Gil is your um, ideal opener and you think there's absolutely no reason for him to have been dropped, um, then I think in that particular situation, what you have to do is you have to actually say uh, that that he comes back into the side, especially as you've talked about, he's a 10-year player, whereas Kyle Rowell at his age is probably a three- to four-year player, maybe a bit longer if, if you, can, you, know, you can squeeze out a few extra years. There. But you also don't want to miss – if he has unlocked something, you also don't want to miss out on those years. So what they might do in his particular situation is they say, okay, we think he's worked this out. We still want to try our opener uh, when, he, when, when he's back fit. Um, in fact, it is – is it Shubman Gill? Who's their opener? I'm so confused now. I know who's, who their opener is. Um, oh, oh, well, yeah, there you go. So I have got confused. If, if they believe he's their opener, right, you bring him back in and you use KL Roll, perhaps it's going to be batting at three or five, isn't it? Because what you probably don't want if you're the Indian team is to replace um, Pujara or Rahane with another 22-year-old who averages 65 in his home pitch in India. If you can replace him with an experienced player who's used to facing the best bowls all around the world, who's finally found another level for his test game, I think that's the way to be able to do that. The, the other thing is that he's been able to make or find this red ball form without playing a lot of cricket. So you might just wait and just say to him, look, you're definitely in our plans for the next four to five years, but we're not going to rush you into the, our team because we don't want to upset the balance of the other players. I just worry specifically about going, this guy's just made 100, so he has to get the next five tests. Uh, I, I was there when Sam Robson made his 100. I think Sam Robson's a really clever player. I think he works really hard. Um, when I watched him make his 100, I was like, this is a player who will not make consistent runs in test match cricket. I don't think he's a consistent test match opener. Um, and because he made the 100, the opposite happened. And I think that is something, I, the same with Zach Crawley. When Zach Crawley made his 260-odd, I just thought that a lot of things came together. He obviously has a lot of talent, but I thought this is actually bad for English cricket. I don't think he's going to be able to replicate this very often at all. Um, and, you know, that has, that has happened um, so far. That's the problem with backing form. That's, form fluctuates. Form cannot be trusted. 
what you really want to be able to trust is um, technical changes. What you really want to be able to trust is consistent run making. Um, and what you really want to be able to trust is having a look if something has fun uh, has changed within someone's game. And I think with KL Raul, we can kind of see that happening. So I, I don't think it is a form thing. But I think that's why teams do it. But they're certainly not going to... He's going to continue to be in their squad. He is... I can't think of a better player to have around your team at the moment than KL Raul because he can bat anywhere from one to six in a test match team. And he can probably bat in most places in limited overs as well. And he can bat in limited overs and red ball. He, he, he should be with India squad until, you know, something happens with his technique. Um, so I think he's a... Um, an incredibly talented player, and I can see why they would want to do that. But I think you just have to be a little bit smart uh, with the way that you do those things. But thank you very much for your question. Thank you, Dad. Daya? Yeah, hi, Jared. How you doing? What's your question? I wanted to ask you about uh, what do you think about the points deduction rule that recently happened? Like... Uh, the World Test Championship cycle, the previous one, mm -hmm. like you got too many points and it doesn't matter if four points were deducted. Like it did matter to Australia. They weren't able to qualify for finals. But like now you have only 12 points for a win. And if you get a point deducted for every over that you did not pull. So what are you, uh, your thoughts about that? Yeah, I think that... <laughs> oh, okay, let's get into... Uh, let's start with slow over rates. Uh, back when I wrote Cricket with Balls, I said that you should be, um, the, the penalty for slow over eight should be sodomy. And part of the reason I said, uh, uh, actually it wasn't sodomy. That's wrong. It was, um, it was, um, uh, being gelded. Uh, uh, people like sodomy. No one likes being gelded. Um, <laughs> and Sorry, I'm entertaining myself if no one else here, but I was I always made a lot of fun of it. There was no reason for it. Back in those days, I remember Dan Vittori coming out once and saying, Yeah, we could bowl our 90 overs easily. We slow down because it's tactically advanced and advantageous. And it is. Like go to first class games, teams mose us through their overs. It is possible to do it. What we've created at international level here is just dreadful. We allow teams to just get away with anything. Uh, you know, I was with Scotland for that uh, World Cup qualifiers. The umpires weren't letting players come onto the field with drinks when players were, like, passing out, <laughs> right? Like, Carl Kutzer ended up, you know, sick in his innings, and the umpires were stopping extra drinks coming onto the field in UAE. And that doesn't happen in, in the top-level international games. We just let teams do whatever they want. The problem is not teams bowling slow. The problem is teams bowling slow, teams batting slower than ever before. Batters have never been slower than how they currently are. Um, you know, that's just, that's just true. <laughs> um, teams bat really slow. We then have a million different reviews and pauses in the game for all sorts of different things. The problem with slow overrates is not just teams not hustling through the field. It is everything, a combination of everything. Here's the other problem with it. The ICC and cricket boards don't mind it. If you've got a one-day game, you want it to go longer. You want it to be on TV for longer. If you've got a test game, that extra half an hour is like a bonus. They want that to happen. And if we gave them that extra half an hour as part of the day's play, they would then stretch that to try and make that an extra half an hour as well, right? Um, that's more ads. That's more eyeballs watching for longer, especially day tests as it goes into prime time. It's like, there isn't a will to fix this. So my problem is that what really needs to be fixed is the system from the ground up when it comes to overrates. I have no problem with teams being penalized. It looks to me from, from what I've heard that we're going to have a, almost like a shot clock situation where, okay, this is the batting team um, slowing the game down so the bowling team doesn't get penalized here. Uh, we're a lot smarter with it than we used to be on, on those sorts of things. But, you know, it is, it, this is a, a situation that could be fixed quite easily. And it's not being fixed because the ICC and credit boards do not want to fix it. And maybe the World Test Championship, because of the points, will change that a little bit. I've, I've got no problem with teams getting... If a team's purposely being slow, I've got no problem with them doing that. Um, I, I know there's, there's this new, new moving tide out there where people are like, oh, it doesn't matter how many overs you have. 
um, in a day and uh, we're here to be entertained. Ask the people who used to watch the 60 overs a, game, a day what they felt. You know, we need, a, we need a penalty because it could – what's to stop teams going for 20 overs a day, right? Umpires are not strong enough to be able to do that um, it, the way that they are currently um, employed and, and um, used. So realistically, I think that the best thing will probably be a points deduction and the World Test Championship I think is quite good for that. But we need to be looking at how slow the game is in every way, not just the bowling, the bowling thing. Just a follow-up question if I have time. Uh, sure. sure. So, uh, well, whom do you think, who do you think is the next Indian Red Ball captain? Is it Shubman Gill or like, who else do you think could be? Uh, Rishabh Pant. But uh, God, that'd be fun, wouldn't it? We might as well shut Twitter down if that happens. Um, yeah, Shubman Gill, Rishabh Pant. Um, I don't know a lot of the younger guys. Uh, like, like I, I haven't spent Can a lot of time with them. Yeah, I mean, he he comes to mind as well. Um, uh, I don't, I, I don't know if there's any sorts of people that are coming through that I see as natural, perhaps captains. Um, but yeah, I suppose Shuman Gill makes the most sense at the moment, but, uh, there's no, I, I, I suppose there's no massive rush. There's also, we always think about it from the young perspective, but sometimes you, you know, most captains are 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, aren't they? So, and you realistically, I'm not sure you could, you should captain India if you're under the age of 26, 27, unless you're an incredible individual, just cause you're just being set up for nonsense on you. Um, so uh, it's that's a very interesting way of looking at it as well. But um, no, I think um, I think Gil makes sense. But Richard Pant is probably in that conversation, even if he makes you feel uncomfortable. Uh, I got Amano coming up here now. Amano, you have mute on. Yeah, can you hear me? I can. What is your question? Oh uh, yeah. So yeah. So yeah. So in. In a, uh, a few days, a few in a video, you said that uh, you wouldn't choose Babar Azam to be the most improved test cricketer because he looks so good. So, do you think like that uh, now that KL Rahul and, uh, and Sam Curran uh, would be in that category because KL Rahul has got, I think, about uh, as many uh, centuries away from Asia as uh, uh, Virendra Seva, which is an unbelievable stat. And I'm just gonna have to stop you for one minute. I'm just going to have to stop you for a minute. I think I did make Baba Azam my most improved test cricketer, didn't I? Oh, I, I, think, I, think, he won. I think he won. I think you said that you, you said that you wouldn't choose him as the be most improved test cricketer because he was too good already because he looked too good. I, but I think I did choose him as the most improved test cricketer on that on that very long video I made. I I could be wrong, but yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think he was. was. Yeah. Um, uh, so, I, 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 he, so he could have too good already. So it was it was already a given that he would become become so good, you know, because that he would be. Yeah, I think I think, I, I think I think that's fair. Like, I, I think so. Um, 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 my friend Jonas is is always making fun of people when they compare Baba Azam to um, Virat Kohli because obviously Baba Azam's record is is way lower at the moment after whatever it is 40, 40 odd tests, but. It'd be really interesting to see what Baba Azam's record is compared to Ricky Ponting's average at a similar point. Uh, you know, there are there have been a lot of players who have started a little bit slower and generally build their average up. Um, you know, we we kind of forget that that it does, sometimes it just takes a while to to be good at Test cricket. Um, and so, yeah, it would be interesting to have a look at maybe some other uh, very good players at, around that period and and see where they were, but. The most improved player is this sim is a similar case because well, he uh, also looked too good. Yeah, so the most improved player is something I got from basketball. In fact, when I came up with it for the the, the video, I didn't realize that it wasn't used in a, in a lot of other sports. Basketball must have just come up with this idea, and it's a really really fascinating one for me, and always has been because we we praise the rookies, right? Someone comes in and does something great straight away, and everyone's like, ah, oh, we love them. And then we praise the players when they're at their best. But the really interesting players quite often are the guys who, you know, do what Ishan Sharma's done, uh, who, uh, who do what Mitchell Johnson did, and those sorts of players who for a long time are very 
mediocre, even worse, and then suddenly get everything right. And, you know, they go from being role players in some cases to being superstars. And, but you can also go from being a fringe player to being a role player as most improved. Or you can go from being a very, very poor rookie over your first two or three years in the game to being a very, very good player. So most improved covers all these different kinds of players. So a lot of people, a lot of people look at it in a different way. Some people look at it as the biggest jump from what you were at the start of your career to the end. Some people look at it from where you have been consistently. So Kyle Raul will be one of those players that if you look at, it's way too early to make this call, right? Let's be, let's be completely honest here. He's played a couple of good innings. But if he was to continue to do what he's done in the last couple of innings for two years. That's a tenor right? stat, isn't it? That he has as many of his centuries as Rinda Sevag. And Sevag is seen in, in, more, even one of the... in test cricket. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. In as many of his centuries in test cricket as Rinda Sevag. As an opener. Yeah, I, I mean, for him to say where I was a, a home test player, I, I don't think anyone really ever massively disagrees with that. Um, but, but again, he still was only averaging 35, right? He wasn't making uh, – I think K.O. Rowell's problem has, uh, has been, as I said before, is those big fluctuations, and he, he's never been able to put it together consistently as a run scorer, especially in, in test cricket. If he was to be able to do what he's done now for the next two years, uh, then he would be a huge chance to be the most improved player. And he's the sort of player that you want it to go to. You want it to go to someone like him um, or um, someone like Ishan Sharma, um, someone who's been in the system for a long time, has worked out their game and has taken it to another level. That's how I see um, most improved players should be. With Baba Azam, I think he had the most improvement of any player, and I, I don't think I could argue that. But a lot of the improvement he made was from when he came into the game and he really struggled, which is a perfectly normal thing for a, a, a new player to do. Um, and so what I'm saying is that there's different levels of most improved. And so, you know, p- people also um, put Pat Cummins on the list. So Pat Cummins had obviously improved as a player, but Pat Cummins had gone from being one of the best players in the world to an outstanding great uh, and so again, he had improved, but it's a different level of that. Kyle Rowell is going to be going from Pat someone Cummins who averages. Injury. Sorry, he Pat Cummins just recovered from an injury. You know, no, no, he hadn't been injured for a while. I'm talking about the period. I, I'm talking about the period where he'd been in the team for a while. So, 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 yeah, there are different levels of that. But with Kyle Rowell, it, we can't we can't just say he would like he wouldn't even get nominated for my most approved players at the moment. He'd have to be able to do this for a couple of years. And there's a reason that I have that in there. And it's because, it, you know, he's played a couple of good innings. He's a really talented player. James Vince could play a couple of really good innings, right? There's a lot of players around the world. Travis Head can come in and play a couple of really good innings. Yeah. To be able to tell if those guys have taken that next step up, that's two years. That's home and away for two years. But he certainly has the talent to be able to do that. Yeah. Can I ask the second question? Which is sure. Sure. Uh, that, yeah, Andrew Flintoff, uh, about Sam, Sam Curran, Andrew Flintoff once said that when he was young, he knew he only had a few balls in him. So you, do you think that's a normal thing for on rounders now? We are seeing that in Hardik Pandya. We've kind of seen that in Ben Stokes. So, uh, you know, well, what do you think Sam Curran's future is? Because he seems like he can bat at number six because, you know, Butler is batting there. He, he, he pretty much left a straight one in the first, in, in the second innings. Yeah, I don't think Sam Curran can bat at six. He's got a lot of limitations to his batting. Uh, he takes a lot of... So not exactly a fourth six seamer, is he? No, no, but I don't think he... I certainly don't think he can bat at six. Um, at seven, he could probably average high 20s batting at seven over a long period of time because he'll get a couple of good matchups and he will smash... When he when he gets going, he does smash the ball. Um I just don't think his game is rounded enough to be an, a number six um, consistently. Um, in the same way that, you know, I talked about recently, I'm not sure Ravi Dejaja has a game to be a consistent number six at the level he is um, at number uh, at number seven. Not to say that either of them couldn't do a role there, and I think Jadeja is a lot better than Sam Curran. Uh, it's just a, it's a proper batting position. Um, yeah, look, Curran, uh, part of Curran's problem is that he fits into this team really well when you have Ben Stokes in the team. Because that gives you added flexibility, which means that you use Curran when he's at his absolute most needed. 
Uh, and then he can, at number seven, I think he's fine. I think they could find perhaps a bit, you know, they could, if they could find more batters, Butler would bat at seven, pro- most probably, right? And you would have uh, Wokes at eight, and I'm not sure you even need Sam Current in that situation. But injuries and COVID and everything that's going on, uh, you know, uh, well, Ben Soakes' mental um, health, everything that's going on at the moment means that that is not going to happen. So I think that is uh, uh, where we are with him. I think he's a limited player with a lot of very special skills uh, and he fits into certain teams really well and he's going to fit into other 11s very poorly. I, th- I think that's fair, but he's very young. Yeah. So how do you think he, at the moment he's going to develop as an all-rounder? Because he seems like someone who could be a batting all-rounder, but it, it isn't clear, like similar to Hardik Pandya, as it's not very clear that I don't think him or Hardik Pandya. I don't think him or Hardik Pandya will ever be batting all rounders. Would be my guess. I think they'll both be they'll both be handy with both. I, I can't see how either of them could bat in the top six um, and make you an average more than thirty. Um, and I think Hardik Pandya is an incredible talent. I, I just I don't see him as a regular run scorer in Test match cricket when the ball's wobbling around. Um, he's never done it against the red ball before. He might have a development spurt. Either of them might have a development spurt. I, bo- I think just both of them have weaknesses in their games that in test match cricket, you can exploit over long periods. And I think that will happen for both of them. He goes to the young, so he has time. He, he, look, he has time. Um, but you're, what you're talking about is a pretty radical move, right? You're talking about going from someone who can bat a bit to batting top six in a test match. That's not... That's not a normal thing, right? That's not that's not something that happens very often. The sorts of people who have done that are what someone like Mark Richardson, who took a year off cricket um, and went, re- went and rebuilt his game, and all he did was basically learn the forward defence, right? Uh, that's the sort of thing that someone like Ravi Shastri did over a generation. Um, Imran Khan did over a generation. Even Dan Vittori over, what, 15 years, really only got to the level of being a really good number seven and, and a pinch number six, right? There aren't that many situations where you go from not being a test match batsman to being a test match bat. It, that, yeah, I think speaking from, the, from an Indian's perspective because he, in, the, in the 2018 series, he was very good. He's, he was averaging around 50 with the bat. And he was, yeah, he, every time he came in, he was like the best batsman because he was rescuing the tail on City. Yeah. Like his runs won them the series. No, definitely. He had a very good series. But but Mitchell Johnson once had a very good series against um, uh, England with the bat, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, that, right? And But it, you say that, Australia wanted him to bat six or seven, right? They were desperate for that. Now, I think in some ways, Mitchell Johnson has a slightly better technique than Sam Curran. I don't think he's as good at batting, but I think he had a better technique. But he, what he did not have is the fundamental skills of building an innings, of consistently scoring runs, of getting himself set. And Sam Curran doesn't have those either. And Hardik Pandya doesn't have those either, right? And then what you're doing is going, oh, okay, well, look at the way they strike the ball. Striking the ball is great until P- Pat Cummins is bowling 90 mile an hour wobble ball seams at the top of off stump. Striking the ball great doesn't mean anything at that point, right? It really just, it, that's a different form of batting altogether. Kagiso Rabada, Ravi Dadeja, Ashwin, Nathan Lyon, Red Bulls, deteriorating pitches, overclass conditions. It's a different game. It's a different, and, and batting at number six in first class cricket is nothing like batting at number six in Test Match cricket. It is a huge jump up. Opening the batting in, test, in first class cricket, is much more similar to opening the batting in test match cricket. Um, uh, first class cricket and test match cricket are similar in that way. The, the difference of the first change bowler, the second change bowler, even the third change bowlers in test match cricket is just a level above anything that you'll ever have to do. And that's why when I see someone average like 30 batting at number seven for their first class team and teams are like, oh, well, we'll bring them into test cricket. And I was like, they'll be lucky if they average 20 in test cricket doing that. Yeah. You know, uh, Ryan McLaren, Robin Peterson, those sorts of players, you have to be scoring your runs at four, maybe five um, uh, or six in a very strong league 
Uh, and then you have to be averaging 40 or 45 in that position for me to think that you're going to come in and play test match uh, and score uh, over uh, an average of over 30 um, batting at number seven. I mean, MS Dhoni scored, what, an average of 37 in test cricket? Is that right? 37, 39? Um, there's a lot of really good players that have only averaged between 35 to 40. I mean, Ben Stokes doesn't average over 40 yet um, and may never consistently average over 40 as well. The, the level of batting is so different. It's so different, and I don't think people quite get that. And you see these sort of makeshift. I, I, I remember when um, South Africa went into a test match. I think I've got this lineup right. Robin Peterson, no, Ryan McLaren at six and Robin Peterson at seven. And I said before the test match, that is an absolute disaster against Mitchell Johnson and Ryan Harris. They will destroy that. Those guys have good first-class averages against very, very average bowlers. They are not number sixes and number sevens, when they go up against Mitchell Johnson and Ryan Harris. And we've seen that again and again. And then you, 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 you sometimes you see when those sorts of players bat at eight, they look incredible again. That, because that is a different position and it gives you, you know, a, a different kind of freedom um, and, uh, you know, you, you, you're batting in a, in a different way. But realistically, yeah, it's very, very tough. But um, great question. Um, thank you. All questions. What, just one more for... No, you cannot. <laughs> Sorry, mate, but someone else has been waiting here. Causa has been waiting to finish off. Causa. Causa Nomad. I'm a regular viewer. My name is Kausa. 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 Beautiful. A if anyone who's ever listening to this, if I get your name wrong, please, uh, I'll, I'll still get it wrong next time, but just uh, um, keep, uh, uh, keep uh, telling me. And so eventually it will, we'll sit in. But Kausa is better than Corsa anyway. Kausa, you have the last question. This is for you. Take it home. Yeah. I have recently heard that you were really not a fan. Maybe you were really appreciate you really appreciate so much or as a batsman. So uh, Sorry, I completely missed that name. I'm, I completely missed the name. Who's the player? Somo Sharka. Somo Sharka. Oh yeah. Well, yeah, I would be if, if he ever made runs. So yeah, yeah, that's true. You know, he's not that much consistent. So my question is, you know, uh, about Shomo Sharka, uh, and also you uh, know that cricketer, you know, Liton Dash. Yes. Yeah. Uh, also about him and uh, cricketers like David Warner, and then Corey Anderson. So these are the cricketers who uh, were really, man, really. Uh, you know, shown some character in the international cricket right from the start, but in the middle of the career and also now, they're not really that, uh, not showing that glimpse of them. Why have this reason? Why this is happening? And uh, also for David Miller case, you know, he was seriously, you know, we thought that he is the next Gale or something or anything you know he was hitting the ball really well but in the middle of 2015 he was he lost his parts and really felt like the average batsman also that was also yeah. the question uh, and uh, mostly importantly from a Bangladeshi from Bangladeshi what what is the problem of little dash I think uh, it's a phenomenal batsman to watch I really don't understand why he's not scoring anything if uh, I certainly in different way yeah. to get out in every match. Let's look at this from a bunch of different ways. I think part of the problem with David Miller wasn't that he got bad. It's that after everyone saw him, we realized he was slightly more limited as a player <coughs> than we originally thought. And teams started to not work him out, but slow him down a little bit. Uh, I've looked at his numbers. His numbers are still great they're, you know they're really good numbers he's he's been a good player for a long time now he but at you were comparing him to chris gale that's the greatest t20 player we've ever had right you know the the greatest t20 score up slash um that, that that has ever existed that's a huge player to be compared to and if you're not at that level does that mean you're no good or does that mean that you are just a limited player and I think in his particular case, he was a slightly more limited. Well, also, uh, his game also declined. That's why I'm saying I'm not saying that he's that limited. Uh, uh, but, but, 
is didn't didn't um, uh, go far from he, there. No. Yeah, his de- his game declined because we saw more of him, and teams worked him out. That's generally what happens. Um, you know, unless you are an absolute elite player, um, if you do have any weaknesses, and I think David Miller has a, quite a few weaknesses. It's just that his strengths are so incredible. Um, that he overcomes quite a few of them. But he does have weaknesses within his game. And I think because of that, I have a situation there where he is um, uh, hes a very, very good limited player. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that you built him up and people had built him up to be this incredible player. Corey Anderson is more in the Bangladesh camp. Corey Anderson was promoted to first-class cricket when he was, what, 15, 16? Uh, very, very young. Sort of thing that shouldn't probably happen, but he's six foot five and bashes the ball everywhere and can bowl. Left arm, even more importantly. Um, the two Bangladeshi players again. There's a huge problem with Bangladesh cricket in that any time anyone shows any talent, we rush them straight into the international game. They don't get to develop properly. They don't get to grow their game. They then get told how great they are very very early on. There's a huge hero culture within that. That's not quite the, the case with Corey Anderson. Um, and I think sometimes it stifles development. I think all those four players you have mentioned are fine players, but with weaknesses. And I think in David Miller's case, he's actually overcome his weaknesses far better than the other three have. And then uh, with the other three, um, I think that they have weaknesses that, that teams have been able to exploit consistently against them. And there will there might be a point when you between the age of twenty seven to thirty when you overcome all that because you are talented and you work it out and you work out how to make runs consistently. I think David Miller has. I think the other three have not. It's a fairly common thing, and I think it's a big problem within the Bangladeshi system, sort of hero culture. And yeah, I, I spent a lot of time talking to people, friends of mine who've coached in Bangladesh over the years, and they say these kids come through, they play a couple of good games, even at the underage level, and everyone gives them the keys to the city every time. And they don't keep working on their games. They think that uh, they're going to continue to be fine. And there's a big problem at the moment getting Bangladesh players who are good and making them incredible. And a lot of that is work ethic, discipline, putting pressure on them. They know that there aren't you know, it's, if you're a young Indian bat, you have to work on your game day and night because there's going to be 20 other young Indian bats coming through, right? That's not the case in Bangladesh cricket yet. It will be, hopefully, um, but it's not yet. So that pressure happens. A similar thing with Corey Anderson. There was not going to be another Corey Anderson. There's only going to be one because he's such a freakish talent. Um, and I interviewed Corey Anderson and he's, uh, I find him a really interesting cricket. Uh, I'd love to interview him again now that he's, going off to play in the USA. He basically felt like he was a pretender his whole career because he felt like he was pushed on potential the whole time and he never actually developed all the skills that he needed to be a consistent international player. And uh, the Bangladesh players might not be as um, aware of that sort of fact, but I think a similar thing has probably happened with them. They were pushed on potential and they obviously potentially, as you've said, they're both brilliantly talented players. But they I haven't think worked on the game. Uh, you know, Leighton Dash is uh, really one of the classiest batsmen nowadays. Um, who? Or he um, has got so many flaws. Oh, no, he's got flaws. You can be classy and have flaws. James Vince is classy. <laughs> you know, there are there are plenty of cla- you know classy players with flaws. Uh, being classy generally means it looks like you've got a little bit more time. And I think with him, he does that. And also the other thing is then having the elegance of the actual shot making as well. I think in that case, he probably has both of those things. Um, I think both of those players that you've talked about um, would be much better in another environment. I think they would have been better players if they had had the exact same talent that they had and it, 16, they ended up playing in Sri Lanka or the West Indies or Australia or South Africa. I think a lot of the problems have to be, there has to be a reason why we keep seeing talented Bangladeshi players come through and not kicking on. And that is, we can blame the individual players as much as we want. And I'm not saying that they don't all play a role in this. There has to be something to do with the development in that country. You don't have enough bowling machines. You don't have enough indoor training facilities. Uh, you don't have a professional enough situation. The BCB are amateur. 
The, the Bangladesh Premier League got really good and they ruined it. All those sorts of things that keep happening are causing problems for all those young players with their development. And that is a problem for Bangladesh cricket coming going forward. And it's been the problem. It's, from the coaches I've talked to, it's been the problem almost from the start. The facilities aren't good enough. They uh, make heroes out of players who are not ready yet um, and they don't develop their players, essentially. And that development, is, there are... There are players playing club cricket in England and players playing in Madans in India and guys playing club cricket in, in America for, from Jamaican family who are international quality players. Talent is one thing. How to unlock that talent and make it work at the professional environment when people are going to be looking at video of you, when analysts are going to be working over you, when you're going to have to face a higher quality of bowler consistently, when you're going up against guys who can hit harder and play more shots and all those sorts of things. That's when talent only gets you so far. How are you going to shape your game going forward? And I think, I would say David Miller is not that far away from probably being the best version of himself he can be. There's probably a couple of tweaks he maybe could have made to make himself a slightly better player, but I actually think he is a really good player and has been. The other three guys you've mentioned there, I don't believe that is the case. I don't think they've got the most out of themselves. And that's a really common thing as well. The difference is that these four made it through international level and we got a good look at them. So many guys don't even make it that far. But Kausa, thank you very much for your question. In fact, everyone, thank you very much for your uh, questions. Uh, really fun. I got through this. The codeine um, allowed me to go through it. I think I only had one moment where I started talking about sodomy for about two or three minutes there. But we're, just, we, we're all just going to have to live with the fact that I talked about sodomy. Um, I'm pro-sodomy. Um, oh, wait, does sodomy mean rape? Now I don't even know. I'm not, I, I'm, now I'm so confused at sodomy. Um, uh, I'm going to have to go out and look at the Sodom and Gomorrah story again and remember exactly what that means. This is definitely the codeine at this point. Uh, I'd like to apologize for uh, this all going completely off the rails. If you like the Spotify Green Rooms, thank you so much for the questions. Really, really top questions. I, I don't think we've done a Spotify Green Room where the questions just haven't been first class. Um, you know, I've done Clubhouse, I've done Spaces, I've done some of the other places as well. I think the questions at Spotify Green Room have just been great. If you want to follow us, Follow us on Spotify Green Room. Follow my name, Jared Kimba. Um, you get uh, you get told. If not, have a look at Twitter and Instagram. I usually put out when we're going to go live here. It's generally on Fridays, generally sometime around lunch. But thanks to everyone for coming on. Uh, this podcast is also going to be available on YouTube if you want to look at me later looking kind of stoned. Uh, and it will go up on, um, on the Red Inca podcast as well. But thank you so much for everyone for your questions and your time. Have a good one.